Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldy, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldy. Okay, good to see everybody in again today, and uh, we always like to, uh, first and foremost, uh, show our appreciation for those of you who come in for these tapings. We realize that it's not anything that you have a duty to do, but uh, we appreciate the fact that you put forth the effort and you come in and uh, make an audience for us. And then for those of you joining us on television, we just pray again that the Word would be opened up so that you can understand it. And that's the kind of letter that I guess Iris and I appreciate the most is when you write and tell us that for the first time in your life, you're understanding the Bible, you're reading it, you're enjoying it, you're studying it. And uh, that's all we can ask. We uh, have always made it a point not to attack anyone. We don't claim to always be the only one that's right, but uh, we certainly attempt to stay with the Scriptures and compare Scripture with Scripture. Again, I think it'll be on the end of the program that everything is available on video, on the uh, printed page, or in the little audio cassette. Okay, now we're going to get right back in. This is a Bible study, and uh, the last time we taped, all four programs came from verse 3. And today we're going to make a little more headway. We're going to go on into verse 4. And uh, my intentions are to finish chapter 2 today in these four programs, but we may or we may not. But whatever, we're going to start with verse 4, Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, again, I'm going to go back up to the very first word of chapter 3, because you see this question carries right on through to the end of verse 4. The question is all the way through verse 3 and verse 4. All right, so verse 3, verse 1. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which, modifying the word salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, in other words, a reference back to his earthly ministry, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. In other words, not only just the twelve, but there were other witnesses to his resurrection and so forth. And so, though this was all confirmed unto us by them that heard him, now still continuing on with the question, how shall we escape? God also bearing them witness, those who had heard the Lord during his earthly ministry, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And there's your question mark. See that? So this whole two verses are tied to the word how. See? How shall we neglect? And then all of this confirms that we have no reason to neglect so great a salvation. That's the way we have to look at it. How can we neglect something that has been so meticulously, so miraculously revealed to the human race? See, and I think this is where the Lord ha has blessed even our teaching ministry, is that we are making these things so, so understandable that we're not just throwing stuff out there and expect people to believe it, but the Scripture meticulously, intrinsically, puts it all together. All right, so now then we can come on in verse 4, the last half of the question. God also bearing them witness, those who heard the Lord during His earthly ministry in particular, being witnessed with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Now, there are only two places that I'm aware of where all three of these words are used in one verse. This is one, and the other one is back in Acts chapter 2, but we'll look at that a little later. Now, these three words in the Greek, and I think maybe this is a good time to uh, maybe use our blackboard, haven't used it for a long time, the first word is semion in the Greek, and it is usually translated, and it should be translated, signs. And signs were given to the nation of Israel to teach them something in particular. That was the whole idea of these miraculous signs. Then 
The next one was uh, teras, T-E-R-A-S in the Greek, which was simply, I've got to check with my margin a bit, that was the wonders, the wonders that we hear of so often in Christ's earthly ministry. And these were given to have an effect on the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And then the third one was dunamis, from which we get our English word dynamo, out of which we get a generator and so forth. And dunamis was for the sake of, of uh, power. And it too, I'll have to check a minute so I know I'm sure, was to bring about the works or, as is translated so often, the miracles. Maybe I should put it the other way around, but whatever. The miracles and works were to show the manifest power of God. Now, these three words are used throughout the New Testament, or especially the Gospels, but in two verses, they're all used together. Here in Hebrews, and then in Acts chapter 2. Now, in Acts chapter 2, I think they're reversed in their order, but it's the same thing. So, as we come through our study now, this half hour, we're going to be looking at how during Christ's earthly ministry, he gave signs which were to teach a particular lesson to the nation of Israel. But now, let's get one thing straight. Whether it's signs or wonders or miracles, they are all miracles. But not all miracles are signs. Not all miracles were necessarily wonders in order to have an effect upon the Jewish people, but they all played a particular role, and consequently, this is why we have three different words. Otherwise, they could have just used one word and said miracles. But, as we're going to see a little later in the half hour, when we come to the signs, especially in John's Gospel, they taught a particular truth to the Jewish people that the Lord expected them to understand. All right, let's come back a minute and pick up just a little bit of this miraculous working of Christ during his earthly ministry. And as I've stressed over the earth, come back to Matthew chapter 9, honey, verse 35. And I've stressed it over the years that I've been teaching. What was the basic purpose of Jesus performing miracle after miracle after miracle? To prove who he was. That was the whole idea. The Messiah had been promised ever since Genesis. And the prophets foretold of his coming. But in order for them to understand that he was the promised Messiah from the Old Testament covenants and from the prophets, he performed miracles after miracle. But the various categories of miracles had a different effect upon the nation of Israel, and consequently they're divided. The signs were given to teach, the wonders were, have, were to have an effect, and then his other miraculous works were to show that he was exercising the power of God. Now, it takes a little while to sift all that through, but uh, hopefully before we get to the end of the half hour, you'll see what I'm trying to say. In Matthew chapter 9, now verse 35, and this is more or less at the beginning of his earthly ministry, Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And along with the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, what is he doing? Healing. See? Healing every sickness, not just one now and then, but he healed every sickness and every disease among the people. And that was part and parcel of his earthly ministry. All right, come on over a little further in Matthew to chapter 15. Matthew 15. Drop down to verse 29. Matthew 15. And this was just commonplace in those three years of his earthly ministry. Here it is. 
Matthew 15, verse 29, And Jesus departed from thence, that is, from the borders of Tyre and Sidon, back in 21. And so he departed from there, and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee, went up into a mountain, and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them, now look at this, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, or unable to speak, maimed, crippled, and many others, and they literally cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he what? He healed them. Every one. Not just some of them. Every one. All right, verse 31. Now, what was the effect? Well, here it is. In so much that the multitude, what? Wondered. He's got them thinking. You know, I was thinking yet last night, as I was putting some of my thoughts together, uh, what I attempt to do when I sometimes may say things that you don't hear constantly or traditionally is to shock people into thinking. They don't necessarily have to go by what I'm saying, but think. Search the scriptures. Mull these things over. And uh, just not take it so blasé and say, well, I've heard the word this week. That's all I need. You know, uh, our, uh, our churches are full of people who merely go to fill in the hour. In fact, I read an alarming statistic in uh, one of the religious news magazines that I get, and it was a poll that was taken by a Christian poll taker. And what it really amounted to was that about 80% of the congregations really have no solid commitment. And uh, I want to be careful not to be quoted, but if I remember right, I think the pastors that were interviewed more or less came to the same conclusion that it was hard to keep people to maintain their membership over a period of years. They come in and they go. They come in and they go. And uh, I think it's just all part and parcel of the times in which we live. But, you see, when the Lord Jesus performed these miracles, it was to make people sit up and take notice of who he was. He wasn't just another prophet. He was one who had power and could perform these miracles without any of them ever failing, see? All right, so now I think uh, with that we'll go to John's Gospel. And in John's Gospel, I always like to point out the fact that there are eight miracles, and they are all semi-ion. The word in the original Greek in all the miracles in John's Gospel, all eight of them, are this word here. And even though the King James and some of your others translated as miracles or so forth, it really should have always been these signs, the eight signs in John's Gospel. All right, now I've got to look a minute where we're at. And that's in John's Gospel, I think, chapter 3, if I'm not mistaken. I've got to look a moment. Chapter 4. John's Gospel, chapter 4. And let's see. Let's come in at verse 46, honey. I hadn't even decided where I was going to start. I think I was just going to use one verse, but we'll use a few more. John's Gospel, chapter 4, drop in at verse 46. Now, this is the second one already in John's Gospel. The first one, of course, when he turned the water into wine. But now, verse 46 of John 4, Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, if you know your Israel geography, and those of you who have been there, Capernaum sits right on the north edge of the Sea of Galilee. A beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous city. Even the, even the remains are beautiful, let alone what it must have been at Christ's day. All right, so he goes up to Capernaum. And when, verse 47, he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, verse 48. There's more here than meets the eye. Look what Jesus said. Except or unless you see signs and wonders, you will, what? Not believe. That's what Jesus told them. 
Now, you see, I think we've got some reasoning to do here. You want to remember that at the time that Jesus in his earthly ministry, there is as yet no New Testament written. The only thing they had was the Old Testament. And so they didn't have the advantage that we've got. See, we've got the advantage of having the whole New Testament now in front of us. They didn't. And so that may be part of it. Now, I'm trying to cover for them a little bit, I'll admit, but uh, I don't want to come down too hard on those Jewish people of Christ's day. But nevertheless, this is what he said, verse 48 again, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So the nobleman said unto him, verse 49, Sir, come down ere my child die. And Jesus said, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And of course we know that the fever left. But the part I wanted to see was verse 54. This is again the second time. See? Now, my own idea is that when the scripture makes a reference to a particular chronological order, that is telling us if this is the second, what should we look for? The third, the fourth, the fifth, see? And that, that's the admonition. So he says, this is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea and Galilee. Well, then if you do follow that through, you'll see that there are seven of these miracles, but the seven in John, as I've already said, were all signs. They were teaching Israel something. In other words, when he turned the water into wine, it was a miraculous sign that he was the only remedy for their lack of joy. They had a lot of religion, but they were in spiritual darkness. And he had come to give them truth and light and joy. And that's what that water in the wine was to show them. Well, when he healed the noble son, it's another lesson for Israel. Spiritually, they were sick. And he alone could bring them spiritual health. And all the way through John's gospel, we have those seven sign miracles. And then, of course, when we get to the last chapter, I think it is, turn over with me a minute to chapter 21, honey. In John's gospel, chapter 21, we now come to the eighth miracle or sign. Now, it's interesting. See, now here's where I tell people, how can they scoff this book? when it is so intricately put together. Now here's just another good example. Six of these sign miracles that had a direct, a direct application to the physical and the natural life of Israel were all registered before he was crucified and resurrected. Or seven of them, I'm sorry. Seven of them were performed before he was crucified. This one then becomes the eighth one, and it was after his resurrection. Now, when you have just a cursory understanding of numbers in Scripture, seven is the number of completion, and eight is the number of what? New beginnings. And so this final sign miracle in John's Gospel was a reference, of course, to the nation of Israel's remnant who will all be saved when Christ returns. So we'll just look at verse 10 because here is the real miracle of it all. John's Gospel 21, verse 10. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Now verse 11. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153, and for all that there were so many, a whole net full, yet was the net not broken. Now in every other case in the earthly ministry, when they had a net full of fish, what happened? The net broke. But this time it doesn't. Well, what's the miracle part? that it was an indication that the remnant of Israel, when Christ returns, not a single one will be lost. They will all be kept for God's purposes. All right, now then to come in once again to our miracles and signs and wonders, come with me now to Acts chapter 2. Now to Acts chapter 2. 
And this is just to show how that the book of Hebrews says that we cannot neglect so great a salvation that began with the Lord's ministry, was witnessed by the twelve and others, and the Apostle Paul, who of course, remember, we still feel is the writer of Hebrews, and then it was all confirmed by the miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus performed. But not only Jesus, it carries on now after he's ascended to glory by the apostles and as we're going to see to a smaller extent with the Apostle Paul himself. All right, in Acts chapter 2 now then, dropping down to verse 22. This is the other verse where all three of these are mentioned in one place. Acts 2, verse 22. And Peter, of course, is preaching that sermon of Pentecost. And look what he says. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Now remember, this is what we're stressing in the book of Hebrews. Jesus of Nazareth was who? The Son. And we're going to be seeing throughout the book of Hebrews how the Son was higher than the hosts of angels, how that the Son had a greater priesthood than Aaron. And so here again, this is where I want you to see the, the correlation that now Peter is proclaiming that Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, how? By miracles and wonders and signs just like we've got them up here, but in the reverse order. First Peter says he did the dunamis, the miracles, showing the power of God. He did wonders that were to have an effect upon the people. And he also performed the signs which had a particular subject to teach the nation of Israel. All right, so now read it again, that uh, this Jesus of Nazareth approved of God among you by the miracles and wonders and signs which God did. See? God did them through the Son, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. And so all the way through now then, we're going to see that even the twelve are going to continue on this using of the signs and miracles to convince the Jewish people, now not that Jesus of Nazareth walking up and down the dusty roads of the land of Israel is the Messiah, but now the subject is the crucified one. The one that was crucified and was buried had been risen from the dead. And since he was risen from the dead, he could still fulfill all those Old Testament covenant promises. So now look what happens. Peter is just sort of picking up the mantle, more or less like Elisha did from Elijah. And he continues on with the same ministry. All right, chapter 3 of the book of Acts. Now Peter and John, verse 1, honey. Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered the temple. Now verse 3, when this lame man saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something. Now, I always have to think, and I don't say this with any idea of being funny, but I think most of us, if you've been in a big city and you've seen a beggar sitting there on the sidewalk, he usually has what we call the what? The tin cup. And what does he expect? Drop in a few coins. And, you know, if he can do that all day, they can gather enough to, to stay alive. And so I think that's what this fellow did. He looked up at Peter and he held out his container for a coin or two and that's all he expected. But see, we're going to have more than that this time. Peter, James, and John are now in a modus operandi like Christ was. They're going to perform miracles. All right. So then Peter in verse 6 says, Silver and gold I have none. I can't give you a gold coin. 
but such as I have, I give thee. Now look what he does. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Verse 8, And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Well, then you come all the way down to verse 11. All the way down to verse 11. Here's the effect. The effect. And as the lame man who was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them into the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly, what? Wondering. Well, what's it doing to them? It's making them think. It's making them think. What are these men doing? How are they doing it? And so it made them attentive to what the twelve were proclaiming. Now I know a lot of people think that's the only way you can reach people today. Well, I don't think so. I don't think the Spirit needs that today for various and sundry reasons, but primarily is because we have the completed Word of God. And we don't have to have a manifestation of the miraculous power of God the Bible itself is all the manifestation I need of who God is and His power. But nevertheless, remember now what Paul is stressing to the Hebrews, this was all done to get this whole system of what we now call Christianity off the ground. And it did take the miracles and signs and wonders. All right, we've got one more reference in the book of Acts, and then this is going to already be gone. Uh, this half hour. Come back with me to Acts 19. I hope we got time. Acts 19. Drop in at verse 11, honey. Acts 19. We've got to move fast. Acts 19, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. See, Paul is already out there now in his missionary journeys. And these miracles were such that from his body were brought to the sick handkerchiefs, aprons, and the diseases parted from them, the evil spirits went out of them. And so all of this again was for the precise purpose of proving to even Paul's listeners that he was not just another human being, he was an apostle of the Gentiles. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.